I'm originally from Oklahoma. When I joined the Ohio History Connection, it was a brand new position. The organization had never had, up until that point, a director of American Indian Relations. You could sense that the Ohio History Connection really wanted to focus a lot more on tribal relations and establishing relationships with tribes and maintaining those and strengthening those relationships. This Tribal Nations Conference is year three of inviting federally recognized tribes to come back to Ohio, tribes who have historic and pre-contact even connections to this place. We were the first tribes to officially be removed from Ohio back in 1832. And so while we have been in Indian Territory and Oklahoma ever since that, then we consider that home. Nevertheless, our history is truly here. It's a long drive from Oklahoma to here. We're not able to be here to protect our sites, our history. Ohio History Connection is charged with that, so it's important to me, to us, to have a close relationship with them, to know of our history, to tell them of our history, and to encourage them to continue to take care and protect our history. This is a sacred site. So what I ask of folks is to have open hearts and clear minds when they come in here because we have to remember that this is a place where people sacrifice their lives over their cultures and their belief systems. We have two days of meetings and then one day where we get out and we go to sites um, that have a connection to the tribe, sites that they would be interested in, sites that we would consider American Indian. Last year we visited Fort Ancient and Serpent Mound. This year is part of the conference. We first stopped at Fallen Timbers. Since the 1780s, we have an influx of our Native American warriors joining together to fight sporadically against the encroachers, the squatters who are moving over. Now there is a clear boundary that the United States has agreed to, which is the Ohio River. Yeah, that's not stopping too many people. So even in our own government, we're powerless basically to stop. As you can read accounts that say there were hundreds of settlers floating down the river every day past the fort. I like the idea of talking with a lot of people. I like the idea of seeing anthropologists, archeologists, learning from them what they know, and then also teaching them what I know. So it's a good two-way communication between the native way of speaking and also the school way of thinking. They're going to cut through that body, which is going to create chaos for the army. Without order, the Native Americans pursue a very small contingent of Americans right into the main body of Wilkinson's first and third. The first and third are going to get their wits about them eventually. They're going to fix bayonets and they're going to start a charge. When that happens, remember, we've got warriors, about 800, who are cut off from the main line of battle because they're a mile away waiting to see what happens. I learned something during the tour at Fallen Timbers. Our tour guide, Shannon, who runs that site, I really value how she went out of her way to share the American Indian perspective because that is what is missing. And I'll tell you, that is a big goal in the work we're doing at the Ohio History Connection. No matter what those stories are, it's our job to make sure we let Native people tell their own histories and their own stories. Eight principal chiefs are going to fall. We have Little Otter, he's going to be shot in the eye. Agusue looks like he's been mortally wounded. So now there's a little bit of panic that's taking place through the Western Confederacy. They retreat back to Fort Miami. The general, he won't let in the Native Americans. He won't provide them aid because he's been told to not directly engage. And if he directly engaged, he has now declared an open act of war on the United States of America, and he is not willing to do that. Fort Meigs, 
This is a reconstruction begun in the late 1960s and finished in the early 1970s. The hill slopes down and there we have the mighty Maumee. In 1813, this is the only crossing point on the Maumee River. The army arrives here the first week of February, 1813, and General William Henry Harrison comes here with troops of the regular United States Army and with militia forces from four states. And today I am dressed as a member of the Ohio militia. Of course, it is a brutal, brutal winter. How difficult it must have been for those soldiers to come here, to have to fell these trees, to dig the trenches, and to work all day, every day, outside in the winter, and then they will sleep right here uh, on the fields that these walls encompass, in a thin little army tent under a thin little army blanket. I'm just basically putting all the pieces together. It's a good reflection on where we were as Native people, where the uh, colonists were at the time, and then it kind of shows where we are at today too. You know, we might not see eye to eye on everything and that's okay, but as long as we're talking, you know, that's, that's a good stepping off point. In the early 20th century, this becomes public land and it was very much kind of like a park. People coming out here, picnicking, and the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, Civil War veterans, wanted to ensure that while people were out here, that they were reflective, that they were thoughtful. And this monument was put up in 1908. It also will serve as a gravestone for all those individuals who fell here. This is the first time of being here to Fort Meigs and I truly enjoyed this. I didn't realize that this is considered the first victory battle of the United States uh, here at Fort Meigs. I was impressed with the obelisk and the Maumee River is of course in our history so it's a beautiful sight to see the Maumee. The barrels in the cooperie everywhere of course hauling the salted beef, the flour, the gunpowder and of course the whiskey. Whiskey is part of the American soldier's daily ration. This is an opportunity to experience the site firsthand, and sometimes they'll let us know if something doesn't look right. It can create dialogue about how we can tell um, these stories more comprehensively. I think it was a little lopsided, actually, um, just because it's the way that they learn. They learn a lot from books, a lot from you know talking to other anthropologists, other archaeologists and uh, they take a real scientific look at things. But I do like how they uh, say that they want to learn more about you know, the, the native oral history. I think at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, they emphasize the fact that that's the one place where it's told totally from the Native American point of view. And I wouldn't say that this is told totally from the Native American point of view, but I'm not sure that it needs to be because uh, there are diverse views and, and we need to know both. understanding how this area got founded and how this area played such a vital role in the development of America is really important. I'd like to see more local people come out here and really take to heart what they see and what they hear and hopefully get more questions than they do answers because I think asking more questions is really the way to learn. <laughs>